So at Now Marketing Group, we work with over 100 clients uh, across the US and beyond, and we help them manage their social media workflow. And we want to talk through just kind of like our process, but we want this to be interactive. So you guys asking questions, if you have questions in regards to how you do this for your business. So we're going to walk you through just what we do. Um, with our clients when we get started with them, and that way you can create a craveable social media workflow for yourself. So basically when a client comes to us, we first start off with them asking them a ton of questions. So how this can apply to your business is first asking some questions of yourself of what you wanna get out of your social media plan and what you want to accomplish as part of your goal. So the first thing that we start with with our clients, making sure this works, is asking them, okay, who are right now are your top fans? Like what have you currently been doing on social media? And who do you want to connect with? So we ask them, okay, who are you wanting to connect with and who do you already have as part of your social media connection circle? We ask them also if they've been following other you know, clients, people that they're trying to get connected with, and then also who their team members are that are working on their social media plan. So how this can apply to you is first thinking, okay, the social media profiles that we have set up today, is this aligning with who we are wanting to connect with, meaning the buyer persona? So how many of you in here have created buyer personas before for your business? Okay, just a few hands. All right, how many have never heard the term buyer persona before, ever? All right. <laughs> what a buyer persona is, is a semi-fictional character that represents a real person that you're trying to do business with. You can use a tool uh, on HubSpot called makemypersona.com. But what this allows you to do is ask the questions on, okay, if I were to try to connect with my ideal person, what are their top pain points that they're having? What are their top goals that they're trying to have accomplished? What does a day in their life look like? And you're painting a picture of what kind of content that you could be putting out that is going to align with that ideal audience. So the reason we're asking these questions up front is because we want to know what is going to make the social media profiles craveable, basically. What are we using the social media profiles to have a conversation about? Because we don't want to just blast out messages. We always like to say we want to be a magnet versus a bullhorn. So like, how are we driving people to that page that is going to offer some kind of assistance, that is going to offer some kind of um, content that's engaging? or that is helpful, or that's highlighting the community. And by creating the personas up front, then this lets us know exactly what kind of content to create. So the questions that we go through for creating a persona, again, you can go to makemypersona.com on HubSpot and do this for yourself. But the questions that we ask are, okay, a ideal day in the life of our buyer persona, like what are they listening to? What are they watching? You know, are they, um, what age range are they in? Um, do they have their family? Yeah, where are they getting their info? We want to paint a picture as if we're describing the person next to you. Because as, as much as we can identify our ideal audience, then that lets me know, okay, Betsy, for example, if I was creating her as my buyer persona, she would appreciate this kind of content. So we start crafting that. Do you want to say anything else about personas? Anyone? Ideally, <clears throat> When creating your persona, it's the more information you can think of for this individual person, the better. Um, if you can just streamline it and just saturate this persona with X, Y, Z, you're going to be able to then take your content and convert it as to how they digest that content appropriately. Some people like to read, some people like images, some people like video. And this way, if you know what resonates with that individual persona, you can create that content to speak directly to them. Um, that when it gets tricky is when you're trying to speak to multiple personas and trying to really figure out which platforms, and that's where changing your messaging comes up. You may have a same message to share to three different personas, but where you're sharing it and how you're sharing it and the language in which you're sharing it could change. So you can't just necessarily say, check out this widget on our website, here's the link, and expect 
Brian and Jessica and Betsy to click on that link because Betsy may read something differently than what Brian prefers to be delivered that content. So you can still have that same message, change your message and change the way it's delivered so that way you're resonating in appropriately connecting with, with that persona. Yeah. And that's the difference between writing an article like Jacqueline was saying, writing an article for a teacher, for example, versus an accountant, right? They're gonna appreciate different kinds of content and you can specify it. So we've worked with several clients that they have multiple personas, like Jacqueline said. They may have up to three is what we recommend people start with, both your positive personas, but then also a negative persona, like who you can't help, who you don't want to attract into your business. So we list out those personas first and foremost, and then we start asking ourselves, okay, what kind of content is really going to resonate with that individual and draw them to our social media channels? Because social media is meant to be social. We want them to engage and have conversation with us, and also, at the end of the day, come back hopefully to our website to get more of that kind of content. So after we paint the picture of the persona, then we start asking ourselves, okay, how can we get the team involved. We wanna highlight as much of the team as possible, the much as much of the company as possible. So in your business, think about if you do have team members, how can I get them involved? As we mentioned yesterday, they are the biggest advocates or influencers, if you will, for the business. So can we highlight them as um, meet the team? Can we highlight them for birthdays, for celebrations? If you guys have followed the Now Marketing Group page, you will see we highlight our team members a lot, but we also look to highlight them on specific platforms. So our Facebook page is way more team focused and so is our Instagram than say our LinkedIn, right? Or our YouTube, for example, because we know that our ideal personas are hanging out on different social media channels. We make the messaging specific for that channel and what our goal is for that channel. So our Instagram account and our Facebook account is meant to highlight our brand as a whole, give you a sneak peek into what our culture is like, what our team members are like, because we know on our Facebook page, it's really consistent of our clients that we already have today, one, and also our team members, our fam their families, and people that already know us, they already like us. So we just wanna keep highlighting who we are as a company on that channel. Whereas on LinkedIn, our goal is to really kind of uh, attract our ideal audience to convert them into a new lead. So we're sharing way more educational content there, uh, content that highlights our work, things like that. So after you ide identify your personas and your platforms that are beneficial to you and what goals that you want to get out of each platform, then you ask yourself, okay, how do I get my team involved? How do I get my current fans that are already in there involved? For example, we have um, different collaborative pieces of content. Yesterday you heard the panel on the harsh truths. That came from an article where I was like, okay, I want to write about the harsh truths of social media, and I don't wanna just write it from my perspective, I wanna pull more people in. So I started thinking who could be a great person that has some great content to share that I can pull in to collaborate with to get them involved, not only on writing this great piece of content, but also someone that's going to share it out after it gets up. So when you think about your current fans, it could be your clients that you're already working with, it could be people you want to work with, and you're reaching out to them to write a piece of content, for example, we worked with a realtor and they are working to help people that are you know, buying and selling homes. So we're like, okay, who can we collaborate with to create a great piece of content? We started thinking about home stagers and also home inspectors. They also have the same ideal audience group, so we asked them for their best tips on selling a home faster. We asked them for that content, we put together one piece of a blog article, featuring them, shared it out, and now they're sharing that content on their social channels and getting involved. So you're thinking through, who can I connect and collaborate with that potentially is already a part of my circle? And then we ask, how can we get our clients involved, whether that's just sharing and highlighting them. For example, we, uh, Brian yesterday shared the 50 Strong story about how they got featured in Walmart. We wanted to highlight that story on our social channel. So we did a live video interviewing them on the backstory to that commercial. So we're getting our clients involved. Mr. Manhole, when he went viral as well, we talked about that yesterday with Wave, we featured that on our channel. So thinking through how you can get your clients involved is really just highlighting them, featuring them, uh, you know, highlighting them as a VIP that they are. 
And then how can I get our community involved is another question that we ask our clients. Like, who are you already aligning with? We work with um, an insurance company that highlights, you know, the garage sales and things that are happening in their community. And we put that on their social channel. But we start asking ourselves these questions right up front so we know what kind of content that we really want to push out. From there, then we start thinking through the process. Okay, how is our social media working to drive traffic back to our website and are we helping to create this frictionless process for our audience? Meaning the content that we're sharing is the website backing up what we're sharing and aligning with that message. So for example, in the, for the blog article that I was talking about with a real estate company, we want to make sure not only do we have that social piece of content to share, that when they go back to the website, they have a blog article and then potentially a download that they can give their name, email address for to, to print off, but now we're helping to build a workflow, right? We're helping to build their sales process from there. After we have the content, the know-how of who we're trying to connect with, what social channels have each goal and what we're trying to accomplish on each social channel, then we start thinking through the four E's. And every piece of content that we write, we want to make sure that aligns with one of these four E's. It's either educating, entertaining, setting ourselves as experts, you know, and, or engaging in what we're doing. So we literally write out 30 days of social posts ahead of time in a Google Doc. Not everybody can, you don't have to write 30 days of social content, we just like to. You can write a week at a time, but the, the important piece is to write your content out ahead of time so you have time to engage on each social channel and you have a strategy for your social media. Instead of thinking that morning, that day, oh, oh no, I got to get a social post out and just quickly throwing something up, you're actually pausing for a minute, thoughtfully writing out your content, and then most importantly, rereading it before you post it out. So we usually write our content out and then we go back and read it out loud. And we ask ourselves, does this sound like a human talking to another human on the other end of the screen instead of it sounding like just, yeah, a robot? So we read it and then we say, okay, how can we make this more engaging? And does this leave the opportunity for someone to com comment back or to engage with us? So we read out that social post, we may tweak it a little bit to make it even more human, um, and then we schedule those posts out. So we schedule a month ahead of time, both with the images and the content. And then that leaves time each day for the daily posting, the engaging, right? The, the real time happenings, real people doing real things. That's the stuff that we want to put out, but that gives us the starting point. We also write out part of our 10-4-1 rule on, okay, out of every 15 posts, 10 of them are curated pieces of content, whether that's coming from one of the people in the community that we've mentioned earlier, whether that's coming from you know, featuring a client, whether that's coming from other helpful pieces of content that aligns with our message. So for example, on the Now Marketing Group channel on Twitter especially, you'll see several people that align with our message that we're sharing their content out as part of that 10 for one So Social Media Examiner, for example, we know that our Twitter is meant to educate and people that align with that message that's helping to educate our audience, we are putting that content in and then as part of the 10. Then the four is the blog article. So things that are coming from our website, whether that's a blog, whether that's um, a video, helpful pieces of content, that's what we're pushing out uh, as part of the four. And then the one is that soft call to action. So whether that's maybe, hey, sign up for Social Media Week Lima, or hey, we have this new webinar going on, we want you to opt in, but that's that soft call to action. So this is a good ratio of knowing we're not pushing out messages heavily for sales, but we are softly pushing some stuff out there and it's in good ratio to the other helpful pieces of content that we're sharing out. Brian? Um, part of making um, your social media fun, like Jessica had already stated, um, listing the birthdays, the anniversaries, and the live updates from your businesses every week is also really getting back in and then making your social media fun. So as all of you have known, who's participated in the social media contest? Raise your hand. 
So that's a majority of you. And you guys have all participated in our ask this week too with filling out the networking card and then giving it back for a chance to win something. So you're also going to do that on your social media profiles. And one of those ways you can do that is not just giving something back, but we partner with Stolly Insurance Group, I personally, and we started Operation Give Back five years ago, and that is currently going on now until July 15th. They wanted to find a way to really get, give back to their communities. They are in five different areas, and they have a wide reach. So what way can we do that while having fun and really being authentic to who they are? And that's always just giving back. So. We created this campaign, Operation Give Back, where they're giving back to charities and their local communities. And we're having people go to their website to place their votes. And at the end, we are giving away um, cash prizes to their local nonprofits. So this works in a variety of ways. It's a way to create fun content. And it's also giving back to the communities as well and leading people back to Stally's website. So it's, it really works great all the way around. Yep. And Stally just, I mean, you don't have to stop there. There's ways to also give back. They take their prize money and give back to the Allen County Sharks program and things like that. So just because you're a nonprofit, you think, hey, what can I do on social media? There are tons of things you can do, and this is just a perfect example of that. Yeah, so what Brian was mentioning is yeah. once you have your messaging and everything that you're pushing out, then it can, you think through how can we create more of a magnet to draw people into our social channels. So in Stolly's case, like you said, it was a contest. On some other channels, it may be featuring you know, bigger names that are connected with you. But what is going to draw people back to your social channels? And then how can you tie in a partner? So like in Stolly's case, for example, they were featuring nonprofits and putting the attention on them. But in return, it's drawing people back to Stolly. And I know a lot of you, too, are a variety of businesses. There's nonprofits, um, B2B, B2C. So there's tons of variety of ways you guys can reach out and attract your audience. So you may think, I'm a B2B. What can I do to have fun on social media? So one of those ways you can do is to give back to the businesses or the clients you want to get in the door with. So how can I do that? I can give back to having a coffee contest on social media and having people nominate local businesses who would like to win free coffee. And who doesn't want free coffee on a Friday or a Monday morning? So that, yeah, there you go. Uh, so that's one way you guys can just have fun. It's just thinking outside the box. And what would I like as a business owner or a consumer that we can give away to just get our foot in the door? Yeah. We work with another insurance company too, Preferred Insurance Group. You'll actually hear Dan, uh, one of the team members that we work with, speaking later today. And they wanted to launch this initiative on just a safe summer driving campaign. They knew that new teens are going to be on the road, they're going to be driving, and they wanted to highlight ways that you can you know, reduce your chance of distracted driving and how to create a, a safe summer driving program. And so they created a page on their website where you could sign the campaign to commit to a safe summer of driving for you and a parent and their teen. And in exchange, then they were giving away tickets to Cedar Point. So it started with the goal first of, OK, who are we trying to attract, knowing their audience group, then knowing what is a way that we can reward them, and how can we make this a feel-good initiative? So once you have all those things lined up, like Brian was sharing the Stolly example, this is a preferred example, both insurance companies that are competing against other insurance companies that sell the exact same thing. So the only way that they're gonna stand out is their personality. So it's how can you add more personality? And again, like we talked about yesterday a lot, your brand messaging. Your message is more important than the product. How can people look at your social channels and really get a sense of your culture, what you stand for, what you're about, just by connecting with you online? Yeah, just like Jessica was saying, there's a lot of different ways you can do that. And another example of working with real estate, there's, as you guys have probably seen online, you guys can enter contests, and that's the same thing we do with another real estate company, is just commenting and celebrating the national holidays. HubSpot has a great social media calendar that lists all of the social media holidays that you guys may see trending on Twitter or on Facebook, the National Olive Day, or things like that that you guys can celebrate online if they pertain to your business. And that's just a great way to have fun, post some great live updates from your coworkers if you guys all want to wear crazy socks that day to work, and then post that picture online. So that's just something you guys can do to have fun. 
And along with um, having found social media, Facebook and other social media profiles do have rules that you make sure that you're not wanting to spam your customers. And working in social media, we do see um, other people break the rules sometimes. So you want to make sure you're paying attention to Facebook's rules. They're constantly updating them. And you just want to make sure you're not spamming your audience. With Some it. of those rules being like, you can't just launch a contest like we've been talking about by just saying, hey, like and share this. That's against Facebook policy. Um, and you can get the post taken down or worse, your page suspended. So. Knowing the rules is key. So like, for example, the one with not putting a contest, a like and share contest out there, you're not allowed to do that. And as with any contest, you also have to say this contest is no way endorsed or supported by Facebook um, in your actual copy that you're using for that social post. Other things being like, you know, we still see brands today, unfortunately, creating like personal Facebook pages as the business name and like trying to, so they can add friends to their business. Of course you can't do that, but there's a ton of rules with all the social channels and just knowing the rules. Um, another big one that we see all the time is people stealing images off Google. Please don't. Um, even if they say they're royalty free on there, just don't. Um, you can use a, a site called Unsplash. So unsplash.com. That is free, royalty-free photos. Um, so use a site like that that provides it, but don't take photos off of Google. Also, don't take photos from other people. We see this a lot with um, some of the clients that we're bringing on, where they're like, oh, I just seen this image on someone else's page, and I decided to use it, and maybe I'll give them credit or not. It still doesn't matter if you don't have approval to actually use the image. You cannot use the image. Unless, of course, you do reach out. So um, there's always opportunity to create a point of engagement at that point, too. Say, oh, I just love what you just shared. That was amazing. Do you mind if I share it? Um, as long as there's approval first, then feel free. Speaking of images, there are lots of tools that you can use to help you create branded visuals for your social platforms. One of the first things that we do when we're working with a client, and you can also do with your own business, is come up with a brand board. And if you haven't done that yet, it's just a matter of, as Jessica mentioned earlier with your content, aligning your visuals on your social with the visual look on your website. So you're gonna start with your logo, you're gonna choose your brand colors, your couple of brand fonts, and then the key is consistency. So that when people are scrolling through the feed, whether they are reading the actual post or just looking at your visuals, they can tell it's you because it looks like you and it's consistent. So that's a good place to start if you haven't done that yet. And I really like the quote that design is the silent ambassador of your brand. So your visuals are speaking for you whether people are reading the content or not. And a couple of tools that we um, use at now that um, you might want to look at if you haven't. Uh, one is Canva. Um, it's a free one that you can use to create images. Um, another one that I use is RelayThat.com. Uh, both of them are have a, a library of templates. So if you have never made your own images before and you're not a graphic designer, as long as you can drag and drop, you can make an image. So you don't have to be intimidated. You can start with a, a template and you simply change out your brand font, you put in your logo, and you change it to your brand colors, and it's going to look amazing. So it's not intimidating. It's, it's very easy to use. Another one that we use a lot in the office is Wave Video. It's very similar to Canva and Relay That, but it's creating short video clips rather than images. Um, again, you're going to be consistent with your brand font, your colors, and your logo, and dragging and dropping, you can become a videographer. Yeah, in some ways that we're using to push out more video is like 
talking about the content that we were writing earlier for our blog and our website, we will take that same blog and then think of how can we turn this into a quick video that's still offering value, but then also driving people back to the website. So the blog may be on social tools that we use, and we could create a video on just this, you know, like here's the social to tools that we need and to use for your social media, but then also mention our copy, you can go back to the website and get the full list, right? So that's an, a way of creating video that is articulating your message, but in a craveable, more fun way. Um, so that's how we use Wave a lot in the office is to think of ways that we can extend our content lifespan. So how can we take one piece of content and make several different pieces of content out of it? Another thing that you want to do is always go back to your insights on Facebook and see how those posts are performing. So at, before we write all of our content for the following month, we're checking to see how we did the previous month and what types of posts and visuals are um, attracting the most engagement. So you will be able to track this month after month and see, OK, our fans love video hello, we need to do more video, or our fans really respond well to X, Y, Z, so we need to work more of those types of posts into the, to, into the following month's content. As well as, yeah, your Google Analytics, that's key too, because it's a fine balance of driving people back to the website, but also keeping the engagement up. The only real numbers that we look at when we're looking at this is how high is our engagement score? That's our number one, but then our number two is what did that mean for business? So did they come back to the website? Is the social driving more engagement on the website as well as actions took on the website? So there's a fine balance because you can't share a lot of links and social media back to your website or chances of people actually leaving that social channel and going to your website go down. So it's a fine balance of driving people back to the website but then also keeping the engagement up. But we've talked to several clients too where they had high, high, high engagement scores because they were doing giveaways and things like that, too heavy, but it didn't translate into ROI at the end of the day. All they were doing is getting engagement, but nobody had even a clue of what they actually did because all they were doing was giveaways and contests and things like that that didn't align with their message or what their goal was at the end of the day. So there's a fine balance of engagement, but what did this translate to in business sense for ROI? I was gonna just piggyback on that really quick. Um, especially with contests and you have that peak of engagement and you have that spike, and we see that with our clients a lot the, next, the following month. If we don't have that same peak and spike, they're looking at their engagement rate and questioning what happened. And it's, it's taking a look back and saying, okay, really identifying, and that's where those insights are really important, what was it that just spiked that? What was it that just shot your, your analytics through the roof? And is it tangible and realistic to maintain that consistently? And if you can say yes, okay, great. Then if you are continually like, recreating that, then that's awesome. But you also have to have realistic expectations as to what you're doing. Um, so if you have a contest, you've, you're going gangbusters with, you know, the safe driving opportunity for preferred, you know, we're going to see a natural increase. But then once that contest is over, what are we doing to replace and replicate that in another tangible way? So um, just keeping an eye and keeping a realistic look at your engagement scores. Um, and then also like what Jessica said, if it's not translating back to your website, you're not getting those conversion points, then you need to take a look at what you're doing on your website. Okay, if you're getting the conversions to your website, but they're falling off, where are they falling off at? What's happening on that landing page that they're not converting deeper into your website to make that conversion and to make that score? You're not making that sale. So then taking a look at your pages. Do you need to build out your content there? Do you need to start amplifying your message a little bit better on those pages, creating value for your content and for your user to travel through their website? Um, we get we see that question an awful lot. Well, where, why are, why is my site visits down? Why is my, my time spent down? Well, bounce rate high. yeah, bounce rate high. And that's, that's, that's where you have to start, stop, stop. Pretend you're the client, pretend you're the user. You know, we love everything that we share, right? It's all awesome. So we think you should keep going through the, through the website naturally, but where is it that there's a disconnect? So take a, a realistic, hard look at yourself and what you have shared and making it a little bit more um, 
amplify towards what they're looking for. So, sorry, I digress. <laughs> I did want to add, too, that when you're thinking about your visuals, um, we have noticed that our clients, fans, and followers love to see real-time photos. They really want to see you, your business, what happens day to day behind the scenes. They want a peek behind the curtain of what's going on. So it's not always a matter of spending the time creating your own visuals. They want to see real-time photos too. So make sure you're adding that into the mix. Yeah, and that's part of the 10 for one as well. But we are creating and scheduling content out so we have more time for those real-time, real people doing real things post. That's part of the stories that we want to continue to grow, part of the social pages that we want to really push out. So we truly, truly uh, try to align with our clients to say, OK, we can manage the day to day, but we need to feel like your social channels are a highlight of what's actually happening in person at your location. That's what we want to translate online. And as Jacqueline said, looking back to those analytics then to see, OK, is this translating into an ROI at the end of the day? So we mentioned some of the free um, photo sites before, the unsplash.com. There's a lot of those. And I apologize. I think our slides got exported to PowerPoint. And so it's cut off a little bit there. But uh, Unsplash is our most used free, royalty-free stock photo site in the office because it doesn't feel like stock. Like another thing with using imagery, if it's not a real people doing real things post in real time, we want the images that we're creating to still feel like they're natural. You don't want it to look like stock, uh, even if it is. <laughs> so we try to use some images that are just um, highlighting things that were, are happening, but still look like the brand and don't feel like stock. Um, so we create the images. Betsy is like the queen of Canva um, and all the imagery in here. But we create those images that align and look like that brand, share those, schedule it on social media. So we do 30 days at a time. But we're also aware if something's happening, for example, in, in that office, that location, maybe um, we had one client that uh, we work with uh, CPOA, which is California Police Officers Association, and we schedule out their posts. Well, they had a fallen officer that had passed away, and we had scheduled posts for, of course, that week. We had to unschedule all of them because we wanted to recognize that fallen officer. So even if you are working ahead and scheduling your post out, it's still being aware of what's really happening. You don't want something to go out that is like, why would they share that? you know, today, now, when we know that this is really happening in their brand. So creating that that shift. So writing the 30 posts out in, in a document, rereading it, creating some imagery, imagery for it, scheduling it out, and then encouraging the real time, real people doing real things post. And then we spend our time working through engagement every single day. Engagement is our key. I say this all the time, like I do not post every single day on social myself because Sometimes I'm just not feeling it. Like um, Mike Alton was mentioning yesterday, like sometimes you're okay to not share a post. But every single day I am showing up and engaging. That's the most important part. So you can't forget that even though you're scheduling and planning ahead, that really social is about the engagement. So I spend way more time engaging than I am like sharing out our own pieces of, pieces of content. So we schedule it out, engage, look at the analytics, and then from there, we're always trying to improve upon that, the plan and the process, working with uh, clients, looking at what did that translate for them as, as ROI at the end of the day. One extra thing that we do, um, we meet monthly. All of our account managers will sit down and have a conversation <clears throat> with our clients. And what they're looking for is an overview. It's a high level peak as to how the month performed. Um, as marketers, everything comes back down to it. It's ROI, ROI, ROI. How are we proving our value um, for the dollar spent? And everybody thinks that, oh, I think the question was asked yesterday, or is social media is a free? It's free. You can just do that. Well, it's not free. I mean, you're spending time, employee time. There's so many resources that go into it. Um, so it's it's tracking that, that ROI. So our account managers, well, we'll do analytical, analytic reports. So they're pulling reports from all of the social channels, tracking how they, they performed, which posts were the standouts, 
if something fell off a little bit, recognizing it and saying, you know what, this didn't perform how we were hoping, but you know what, we've got X, Y, Z ideas to see if we can rebound this. We'll keep an eye on it, give it a go and see where we're at next month. And then they also are pulling reports through Google. Um, HubSpot has reporting and um, a couple other platforms do reporting for us as well. And so we're taking those, looking at them, aggregating everything into digestible points for our clients so then we can sit down and have a conversation. And some of and that conversation ends up being that, you know what, this platform is not for work. us. We're not spending any time here anymore. Yes. And it's okay to know when to cut it off. You don't want to quit early, of course, if you're just starting something, but it's okay to say, we don't need to spend our time on this platform that's not performing anymore and it's not doing anything for us. So part of that monthly review is having a time for yourself or whomever is doing your social media posting and having that pause and check in point mm -hmm. of saying, is our plan working? And what do we need to maybe pivot and do differently? We've had clients where they're like, okay, Twitter's just not for us, for example, but we want to align with maybe Pinterest. Mm -hmm. So it's not about how many platforms that you're on, it's about which ones are creating the best impact for your brand, and then having those check-in points of knowing when to potentially stop doing something or double down on something. We've also seen with clients where something's really, really uh, growing like for them and, and creating this ROI, where we're like, okay, we're gonna double down on this, and this is where we're gonna spend our ad dollars spent on what's already working, and we're going to double down on it to increase that even more so. And that's another thing, too. We didn't really even touch on um, monetizing things. Mm -hmm. So there's organic growth and organic content is great because it makes you, it knows, it shows you're making your connection with your relevant audience and your right audience to correct those buyer personas. But there's also a great mix of amplifying your message through dollars spent. And social ads are an inexpensive way of doing that. And you can make a huge impact. And like Jessica said, it's not about being a bullhorn. It's about being a magnet. And it's with the the demographics that you can drill down to through social ads, you can pinpoint exactly who you want this message to hit. And then your message is hitting the right person. The last thing you wanna do is just push out a crazy amount of ad dollars. Don't put any parameters around it. You get all these impressions, but who are they for? Like, they're not for your audience. They're not talking to anybody. They're going to deaf ears. How many times do you drive past the billboards along the highway and it makes zero sense to you because yeah, it doesn't resonate with you. It may resonate with Brian and he gets it, but it's wasted dollars on me. So if you have the opportunity to really just pinpoint those pieces, then the more streamlined, the more direct your message will be, and it's gonna fall on, on the, right, the right years. And that's the last tool mentioned on here, actually, is the business manager part of Facebook where you create the ads, not boosts, but ads, right? Um, so we use the business, business manager heavily, and there's actually gonna be a table talk with uh, Tony later if you are interested in learning more about Facebook ads. I highly encourage it. Also, on magnifying smaller communities of your current audience or people that you're trying to attract into creating either a Facebook group, which Bella's gonna talk about later, and also there's table talks on that. Um, but knowing how to encourage and amplify your message through working through your marketing army, which is the, those, that group of fans. So like, for example, the Facebook group that all of you are part of with Social Media Week Lima, but we also have a relationships and ROI, ROI group uh, that is highly active that we encourage and put in information of like what's happening in social media, new things that we have coming out. But we know that that's our group of VIPs that want the first alert on new things that we're, we are rolling out, but also that they need to stay in the know about. Yep. So we have 10 minutes, so we want to open it up for any questions that you guys have, too. Uh, yeah. Here, I you got it? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. We'll bring you a mic. So I'm curious about how many recommended posts per day, because I know you said you write out content for 30 days, but mm -hmm. that doesn't necessarily quantify how many posts per day, and is it different for different platforms? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have like one per day is kind of the rule, but on Twitter, you probably need more. 
if you want to get seen. And we also think through, is this stories, for example, like on Instagram, so we may be sharing one post on Instagram per day, but if we're doing a story, then we need to think through like, okay, this needs to be a full story. They call it stories for a reason because you're supposed to be telling a story in it. Um, so we, we think through that, but at least one per day. Um, and then if you are on Twitter or Instagram, for example, then you want to think through, okay, is this worth sharing and worth someone stopping and looking at or not before you create it. And even with Twitter to help increase that number, um, it goes back to engagement. So you may have your own post for your company um, or your business, but then as you're retweeting or as you're liking and sharing, you're creating additional content for your page too that helps build up those extra posts for the day. Yeah, and we use a tool called Deliver It um, that we have like Social Media Examiner, for example, some of the 10, the curated content that is sharing that content, is putting it into a format where we can kind of share that out on Twitter to help us to create more content there. Um, you just want to be careful and make sure that it's something that definitely fully aligns with your brand and is relevant to your audience. You don't want to put something out just to put it out. Can you speak to the difference of building a persona for your customer versus selecting interest when you're doing an ad on Facebook? Mm. Yeah, so your persona will help lead into knowing how to create your audience on Facebook. That is a perfect way of using it. We use the personas for everything. So making sure that our content is speaking to that person, but then also in our blog articles to, to really drill down who it's speaking to. And then yes, your interest on the ads that you're creating. So your persona, when you're creating it, you want to think through, okay, what are they reading? What are they watching? Who are they listening to? Right? Like, um, what demographics they are, you know, um, you know, what does the day in their life look like? So you're really truly painting a picture like as if you're describing a best friend or someone next to you. And that's really gonna help you then specify your ad according to that person. So it's a line, but interests are just saying, some of the things about them, a persona is really getting in, in high detail you on should the person. Be able, you should be able to actually take your persona doc have it open as you're building out your mm -hmm. your Facebook interest and say, okay, this is here, this uh, this applies here. So mm -hmm. taking that that doc as your roadmap as to building out those other pieces because everything should be listed in into your your persona document. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? One other tip, we take that persona document and we actually use it to um, not only to plan the persona, but then we think through all of our blog articles. So we have it in a, in a Google Doc, where you can do this in Excel, writing out your persona, right? And then we have all the blogs, offers, everything, then aligned with that persona right underneath. Or you can use like a tool like Trello to, to plan it out and it's super helpful. Um, I was just curious. So you, I know you, you guys spoke about having multiple clients in the same niche. You know, how do you curate content and keep it fresh so it's not overlapping? So like for me as a, a small business, um, I'm just starting out. You know, I have, for instance, like a stump grinder. I mean, if I want to get another stump grinder, I mean, that's hard content to create. So yeah. how do you do that? Oh, yeah. We, we work with the insurance companies were like the fun ones out of the group. We work with like nuclear pharmacy and like manholes, you know, like super fun content. Um, well, the first thing is we assign account managers to manage the account based upon personality and style and tone. So if we are writing content for the client, we want to make sure that it has the exact tone of voice that the client would naturally say or feel like, right? So then we manage to assign that client to the account manager that would best represent their brand. And we do not put the same type of client with the same account manager. So like when we're talking about insurance companies, like uh, Brian manages Stolly, Monica that's down there, she manages the other insurance company preferred, and we do not have overlap. So if you are someone that is managing multiple clients and profiles, um, it's super hard to to have the same type of clients with the same person. <laughs> One, because they're always gonna be like, why did you give that idea to them? That was fun. You're gonna be constantly like one-upping yourself back and forth, and we didn't want that. Um, so, but fresh ideas, we do talk as a team and just brainstorm through fresh ideas and um, you know, have an open discussion on different clients and, and just try to think of different things that we can do, but then also, 
keep everything confidential as well between the clients so there's not not an overlap there. And there's and we create voice profiles for our clients. So the voice profile really kind of speaks to the tone and to the messaging that our clients have. You may have two insurance agents, but their styles may be very different. Um, where preferred is a little bit more relaxed and engaging and fun. Stolly is still fun, but they're they have just a different, they're a little bit more shirt and tie. Um, so being able to really identify and acknowledge the differences within those niches, and it is difficult sometimes, especially if you have kind of a, a, a unique client that you have to wrap your head around too, how to make this interesting for yourself. Um, and I think that that's one of the things that, you know, we address all the time with our account managers is, you know, just because it's, it's not your cup of tea doesn't mean that it's not someone's. So you need to really make sure that your message is just as enthusiastic as what it would be if they were posting it themselves. So those voice profiles really will help kind of identify how to speak as your client and how to get in their tone and the types of languages and the words that they use. I mean, we've even drilled it down to like, this client does not like acronyms. This client does not like contractions. This client does not like, you know, so emojis. no, there are no emojis for this person. They are no fun zone. No, not at all. <laughs> but like just being able to really kind of speak the way that they are expecting you to represent them. So making sure your voice is theirs. Yeah. And I think there may be, we have time for one more question. And then if you guys do have questions after this, so Mike in the back, did you see her? Sarah? <laughs> sure. Oh, we get, oh. So when you're talking about blog, oh. No, you're fine. No, you're good, you're good. You're when you're talking about blogs, um, do you use somebody else's content to refer back to in your blog a lot or? It or is it just you? Just depends. So you don't want to. You definitely don't want to write something that's the same as someone else. But so we will. We could potentially take an article, like for example, the harsh truth, since we were talking about that one yesterday. And it could be maybe you were inspired by one of the things that it said, right? On on that harsh truth. So you can't buy influence, right? And maybe you're ma writing a whole blog on how you can't buy influence, and you can then link back to the blog that inspired it if you want. So we do want to reference other people. People. I'm all about collaboration, and I love um, Andy Cressidini. I don't know if you, any of you guys have followed him online, but he's amazing and talking about SEO, search engine optimization. And his thing is, you don't ever, or you don't want to create a piece of content unless someone's waiting for it to be shared, meaning they're featured in it, right? So every piece of content that I release for now, I try to feature someone else in it because then it's already creating a share-worthy piece of content. And then on the blog or on the social channels, then now I can share that piece of content, but that'll also mention them and tag them. So not only is it you know highlighting them and attracting to their audience that they're probably going to share too, but then it's driving traffic back to us. Yeah, we'll just, and then we'll wrap it up. Um, so is there a program that you can post to multiple platforms? Like Twitter isn't quite relevant for my business, but it's hard for me to like schedule posts when I yeah. work from a computer? Good question. I'm sorry we didn't mention this already, but we love Agora Pulse and we use that heavily to schedule our posts out. We also use HubSpot. Um, but Agora Pulse allows us not only to schedule, but the most important part is listen. So social listening. So we're not only are we following like different keywords that are relative to our clients, but also like if they're going to a conference, for example, we'll follow that hashtag and listen there. We'll follow, you know, different people that they're trying to connect with and listen there. And that's our engagement list. When we're talking about showing up to engage, that's where we get who we're engaging with there from that list. So we're following different um, words. We're following different hashtags. We're following different people, and we're using that tool to do that. Another one is Google Alerts. Um, so we have Google Alerts set up not only just for our clients' names, but also keywords. So I get a daily thing on relationship marketing. I want to know who's talking about it, right? Um, so to set that up, you can go to google.com forward slash alerts. And literally, you can put in any word in there, whether and I highly recommend at least your name and your business name, but then any other keyword that you want to know what's happening online about it, um, put that in and it'll send you alerts. With the Agora Pulse platform, um, a lot of our account managers use that for our scheduling. There's a calendar right there so you can see exactly what you have scheduled. You can 
put it based on platform where you want it, you can make a change there too. So you don't necessarily have the same caption for your images on Facebook as what you might for Instagram. So that way you can make those tweaks and those changes right there, schedule your day, schedule your time. And then also it has a reporting tool built right in. So you can go back on click the little report button and you have all of your analytics right there for your social platform. So it's a great tool to have um, in, in your wheelhouse there. Yeah. And if you guys do have additional questions, any of the people in the pink shirts in the back, that table of the, in the back there, people <laughs> are all now team members. And you can ask any of them a question about our social media or anything that we have to offer. We're happy to answer it for you. Or if you think of something when you leave here, just connect with us online and send us a message and all of us will be happy to answer any questions that you have. So, thank you, thank you very much.